<clears throat> Elders and sisters, good morning. Merry Christmas. You will never forget being in the MTC for your first Christmas as a missionary. Last night, I was at the home of my nephew, visited with one of his sons who was here in the MTC three years ago. And he could go through in great detail about all of the events that transpired on that Christmas day. And he said it was his favorite Christmas during the time that he served as a missionary. My prayer today is that the Holy Ghost will be here in rich abundance. My prayer is that you will never remember anything that Sister Bednar and I say. My prayer is that you will always remember what you feel as a result of being here today. And that has very important implications for the work you have been called to do. I hope you will remember what you feel more than what is said. Now let me suggest to you why that's so important in your work. As Sister Bednar indicated, we travel the world. And in every stake I ever visit, I visit with brand new converts. And a part of my conversation with the converts is, tell me what it was like when the missionaries were teaching you. Now, if you promise not to be offended, I'll tell you what they say. They say it's the most bizarre, confusing experience of my entire life. These young people who cannot speak the language are telling me about this young man and golden plates and angels. It was the weirdest thing I've ever heard in my whole life. It made absolutely no sense. They would jump from this to this. No idea what they were talking about. You okay so far? <laughs> All right. And then I will ask them now, if they didn't make any sense, if they couldn't speak the language, why did you invite them back and why did you listen to them? And the answer is almost universal. We kept inviting them back, not because of what they said, but because of what we could feel when they were there. Elders and sisters, the work you perform is a whole lot more about who you are and what you are than what you ever say. Now, I'm not minimizing the importance of you learning and understanding the doctrine of Christ and making sure that you know it sufficiently well that you can express it simply and clearly. But that's not enough. If you are an elder or a sister and you do not have the power of the word in you, then your words will be as tinkling brass and they will be empty and hollow. So what you are is what brings a tremendous power into the lives of the people that you will meet and teach. I'm I say frequently the preach my gospel is not a manual. It's what you become. It's not a book that you read. It's who you are. And as you become that missionary, then you will be guided and you will be directed and you will have a remarkable influence in the places where you serve. Now on this Christmas morning, I bring to you the love, the blessings, the greetings, the Christmas wishes of President Monson, his counselors, and all of my associates in the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles. You're in the right place at the right time in your life. You are absolutely where the Lord wants you to be. Now, it's the Sabbath, and it's Christmas. If this were not the Sabbath... I likely would have just turned this into a large question and answer session. But since this is a meeting in which we've partaken of the sacrament, that would not be appropriate. So let me describe what I hope to be able to do today. I hope to testify of him whom we represent. And I want to see if I can't help you learn some things that will help you learn of him, not about him learn of him. So I'm going to invite you to work with me. Are you willing to do a little bit of work? The work is not going to be in the form of standing up or talking. I mean, your mind and your heart all need to be here. Have you ever been someplace physically, your body was in a chair, but your head was someplace else? 
Ever done that? Well, don't do that for the next little while, okay? Because if you will pay attention to just a couple of these things that I hope you can begin to learn, it will help you learn of him, not only during your service as a missionary, but throughout your entire life. Now, a number of years ago, I attended a training meeting at which Elder Neil A. Maxwell presided. I went as one of his companions. I was serving as an Area 70 at the time. And during the course of his instruction, he made a comment that greatly impressed me. Now, some of you may not know Elder Maxwell very well. He passed away about almost eight years ago. But Elder Maxwell had a facility with language unlike anyone you'll ever come to know. If you read some of his, of his writings and his talks, you have the message, you have a dictionary, and you go back and forth between what he said in the dictionary, trying to figure out most of the words that he used. But he could also, in a very simple phrase, put more information than you could possibly comprehend. And you had to ponder it and dig it out. I think Elder Maxwell was a modern-day Isaiah. This was the statement that he made. There would have been no atoning sacrifice without the character of Christ. There would have been no atoning sacrifice without the character of Christ. In the lectures on faith, it indicates that there are three things necessary to exercise faith unto salvation. One, simply accepting the idea that God exists. Number two, listen carefully to number two. A correct understanding of the character, attributes, and perfections of God. Character, attributes, and perfections of God. And the third characteristic is an actual knowledge that the course we are pursuing is in accordance with God's mind and will. Notice that in order to exercise faith in God, we have to accept that he exists and understand his character. There would have been no atonement except for the character of Christ. Well, when I heard Elder Maxwell say that, it just caused me to ponder and to think. And when I returned home after that weekend training session with him, I began to try to figure out and learn about character. What is character? What is the relationship between the character of Christ and his atonement? And what does that mean for us as disciples of Jesus Christ? Character refers to moral qualities, moral qualities, strongly developed, strikingly displayed, and consistently lived. And you find scores and scores and hundreds and hundreds of examples of the character, the moral quality, strongly developed, strikingly displayed, and consistently lived in the New Testament. I'm not going to tell you many of them because you've got to go find them. But I want to give you enough so that you'll have a desire to go find more. What I learned about the character of Christ, I'll summarize now and give some examples of. And you're wise to try to take notes, but if you're trying to get all this down, don't do that. Just listen. Get some simple things that will help you remember. Okay? Let me teach you a principle very quickly about taking notes when you're listening to stuff like this. If what you do is try to record what the speaker says, then what you're doing is creating your own large plates. Do you remember there are large plates from which the Book of Mormon came and small plates, right? What was contained on the large plates? The history of the people, the secular history. What was contained on the small plates? the prophecies, the revelations, the inspired teachings. If what you do in a setting like this is try to jot down what a person says, all you're doing is creating large plates. You're creating a history of the meeting. 
And truth be known, do you ever use the notes? No. A month from now, could you find the notes? No. Third question, how stupid is that? <laughs> to take notes that you never use and cannot find. If, however, you record the impressions that come to you by the power of the Holy Ghost, what are you doing? You're creating your own small plates. You'll always know where they are. You will use them. And they will be a treasure to you. So don't spend your time trying to just copy down what people say. Focus on what the Holy Ghost is teaching you and put down just enough so that he can bring all things to your remembrance. Does that make any sense? All right. The character of Christ, I think, is a simple thing. I'll repeat this a couple of times so that we can get it fixed in our minds before I give some illustrations from the scriptures. The character of Christ is that he turns out in compassion and love to others when the natural man in you and me would turn inward and be selfish and self-centered. He turns out when you and I would turn in. And you find that expressed over and over in the behavior of the Savior in the episodes throughout the New Testament. What is the natural man? He's an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord and becometh as a child, meek, submissive, humble, patient, full of love, willing to submit to all things, even as a child doth submit to his father. The natural man is an enemy to God. I don't mean to be light-minded, but the absolute perfect image in my mind of the natural man is the cookie monster. I want cookie now. <laughs> right? And when the cookie monster gets a cookie, what does he do with it? He doesn't just get it and eat it. It's like, wham, he's shoving it in his mouth. Crumbs are flying every place. I'm hungry. Give me this now. <laughs> well, that's the natural man. And that's what most of us are like. We want what we want, and I want it right now. It's all about me, and it's self-centered, and it's self-absorbed. And it is selfish. And so if something happens, what do we do? Well, you ought to be feeling sorry for me. You ought to be doing this for me. We turn inward. You never find the Savior doing that. Never. He always turns out. Now let me give you an illustration. Turn with me in your scriptures to Matthew chapter 4. Now, we all remember that in chapter 3 of Matthew, we find the record of the Savior's baptism. So I'm going to begin reading in verse 2 in chapter 4, as the Savior is about to begin his ministry. Verse 2. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward and hungered. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. But he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Then the devil taketh him up into the holy city and setteth him on the pinnacle of the temple and saith unto him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge concerning thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up, lest at any time thou dash thy foot against a stone. 
And Jesus said unto him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain, and sheweth him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And saith unto him, All these things will I give thee, if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Then saith Jesus unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. I want to point out two things. First, there's only one temptation in this episode. Now, typically in Sunday school, when we talk about this, we say, well, there's the temptation of turning the bread, the stones to make bread because of his physical appetite. Yes, that was a temptation, but that's not the primary temptation. That's the secondary temptation. And we say, well, cast yourself down from the pinnacle of the temple. Yes, that's a temptation, but not the primary temptation. It's a secondary temptation. The temptation the adversary threw at him was, if thou be the Son of God. Deny who you are as the Son of God. Betray your your divine nature and heritage. And use your godly powers to turn inward, to satisfy your own appetites, physical, social, whatever they might be. He wouldn't do it. He wasn't tempted by the hunger. It was the challenge from the adversary, if thou be the Son of God. Now, at the very end, verse 11, last verse that we read, Then the devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. He had fasted for 40 days. He had just had this confrontation with the adversary. Would you think he would have been somewhat physically spent, spiritually drained? I think that's quite reasonable to conclude that. Would it also have been of great benefit to the Savior to receive the ministering of angels to buoy him up and strengthen him following what he had just been through. Would that not be reasonable to conclude? Yeah, that would be a good thing. But this verse is not translated correctly. Verse 11. Take a look in verse 11. Can you see the little B by the word angels? Go down to the bottom. And let's go through A and B under 11, where it says the JST, Joseph Smith translation of Matthew 11. And now Jesus knew that John was cast into prison, and he sent angels, and behold, they came and ministered unto him, not Christ, but John. In the midst of his own adversity, of his own physical hunger, and having just had this confrontation with the devil, the angels didn't come to the Savior. The Savior, knowing John was in prison, in the midst of his affliction, sent angels to minister to John. Now, if you and I had just been through what the Savior went through, wouldn't we be turning inward? Look at me. Look what I've done. Give me credit. Feel sorry for me. We would be entirely self-centered, self-absorbed, and selfish. We would turn in. That's the natural man. And what is it that Christ does? When the natural man would turn in, he turns out in love and compassion to others. I would suggest to you that is one example, one episode that demonstrates the character of Christ. And remember, Elder Maxwell said, it is the character of Christ that made possible the atonement and the infinite, eternal, atoning sacrifice. Consider in the upper room, just before the Savior is to suffer in Gethsemane and on the cross. Now, he had already publicly proclaimed, my time is at hand. What that means is, I'm about to die. And he knew something. He couldn't have known everything, but he knew something about how he would die. 
Did he pray for himself? He prayed for the comforter to be with others. He prayed for peace to come upon others. There was nothing as he anticipated the agony of the cross and of Gethsemane that was focused on self. It was all turned out to bless, to comfort, to love, and to help other people. That is the character of Christ. He goes to the Garden of Gethsemane following the institution of the sacrament in the upper room after he has taught his apostles. He goes to Gethsemane and he takes his three chief apostles, Peter, James, and John. What does he ask them to do? Stay awake with me just one hour. He goes and suffers in the garden. Comes back, what are the three chief apostles doing? They're all asleep. Does this happen just one time? No, three times. Now, I don't think he was angry. I don't think he was upset. Could he have been just a little bit disappointed that they couldn't remain awake for just one hour? I don't know, but it seems reasonable. He might, oh, well, you know, they're doing their best, but they have a ways to go. He then is betrayed by another one of his apostles. Three kind of let him down, and one betrays him with a kiss. So you've got four of the twelve not exactly coming through. After the betrayal, the guards of the high priest come to take the Savior. There's a bit of a scuffle. Peter draws a sword, cuts off one of the guards' ears. Now, before I continue, let's just take a look at the sequence of what has just happened. The Savior has been in the garden. In the garden, not completely to finality, but in the garden, he wrestled with and bore the sins, the anguish, the pains, the inequity of all mankind for all time and all eternity. The agony of which was so great, it caused him to sweat drops of blood from every pore. The physical burden of that agony would kill any mortal. Because he is the Son of God, that could not kill him. But the agony was so intense, he sweat drops of blood from every pore. That's what he's just come from with his three chief apostles not standing with him, having been betrayed by one of his apostles. If you had just come from that suffering and that agony, if you had just been disappointed and betrayed by your closest followers, would you or I be worried about the guard's ear? I wouldn't. But what did Jesus do? He healed the guard's ear ear. That is a superficial wound compared to what Christ is in the midst of experiencing. And he has not yet been to the cross. And in the midst of that, what does he do? He turns outward in love, compassion, and service rather than focusing inward about woe is me. Look what's happening to me. I've been disappointed. I've been betrayed. None of that. For the natural man is an enemy to God and has been from the fall of Adam and will be forever and ever unless he yields to the enticings of the Holy Spirit and putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. On the cross, as the agony, the physical agony of the crucifixion begins, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He's concerned about his mother, and so he gives instructions so that his mother will be cared for as he is experiencing the agony on the cross. And to the two thieves, he's doing missionary work. Today, thou shalt be with me in paradise. At every one of those instances, the Savior turns out when you and I would turn in. Now, you go find others. Those are just a few. 
to help you get a feel for that turning. The character of Christ is to turn out in love, service, compassion. When the natural man in you and me would turn in and be self-centered, self-absorbed, and selfish. That is the character of Christ. Now the question is, okay, so what? If I begin to understand something about the character of Christ, what does that mean for me? What are the implications? What are the consequences of that? First, it starts with me, and it starts with you. Now, I'm going to say this really pretty directly. This mission is not about you. It's not about what you want. It's not about if you're getting what you think you're supposed to get as a missionary. It's not about, well, I'm not having success. Who cares what you want? The natural man in you. That's who cares. But if you turn outward in love and compassion and service, you become a very different missionary. Because that turn in your life is the journey from testimony to conversion unto the Lord. Now, as I travel around the world, there are missionaries who are bummed out and disappointed and discouraged. No, oh, I'm working really hard. And I'm not having the success that I think I ought to have. Can you hear how many times the word I is in that? I want cookie now. I want baptism now. I want investigators. I want discussions. Get over yourself. It's not about you. And you know what happens when you get out of the way and you turn, and it's not about what you want and it's about him and serving him. Do you think that there may be lessons he's going to teach you because you think you've done all that you need to do and you don't get what you want? And maybe he trusts you. Or maybe he's testing you. Just get over yourself. Testimony is what you know to be true by the witness of the Holy Ghost. As you study the scriptures, as you pray, as you do the very things you will invite your investigators to do, then by the power of the Holy Ghost, you come to know in your mind and in your heart that these things are true. That is a testimony. But a testimony will never be enough. It will never be enough for you, and it will never be enough for your investigators. It's not enough for you to go and help an investigator get a testimony. If we've got 2,100 missionaries sitting here today, six years from now, a significant percentage of you having served as valiant full-time missionaries will not be active in the church. And you've got testimonies, but that's not enough. Now, it should not be the case that any of you would ever become less active in the church and fall away. It's a possibility if all you have is a testimony. If you are converted unto the Lord, converted, I prophesy, I promise, you will never fall away. And there is a difference between having a testimony and being converted unto the Lord. We're not talking about investigators here. We're talking about me and we're talking about you. When I was a young missionary, I worked in the office for a period of time. One day I was talking to my mission president he said, Brother Bednar, what would you do if one of the 12 apostles apostatized or fell away from the church? I said, oh, I'd be terrible. He said, it wouldn't bother me in the least. And it kind of surprised me. He said, what do you mean, President? It wouldn't bother you. He says, my witness and testimony, my conversion is to the Lord. Now, if one of the men who was serving in the Quorum of the Twelve had a problem and fell away, it would be sad. And I would really be sad at the negative influence that would have on so many other people. But he said, Elder Bednar, my, my witness is of the Savior. I sustain those brethren as prophets, seers, and revelators. But if one of them fell away, it would have no impact on the witness I have received about the living reality of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the truthfulness of the Father's plan. He was converted. He didn't just have a testimony. 
If testimony is what you know to be true by the witness of the Spirit, then conversion is consistently being true to what you know. And in this church, every single member has some degree of testimony, but not every member of this church is converted unto the Lord. Elders and sisters, it starts with you. You need to consider where you are on the pathway of testimony as a beginning, as a foundation, not a final destination. Testimony that continues pressing forward along the pathway of continuing conversion to Christ. There are people who are active members of the church because they have testimonies of their ancestors and their fifth or sixth generation members of the church. That's a great thing. But every time I hear somebody stand up and say, well, my great-great-great-grandfather came across in the Willie and Martin Handcart Company, I silently say to myself, that is wonderful. What have you done lately? They have demonstrated their faith, their testimony, and conversion. Are you just living off of theirs? Or are you paying the price to obtain for yourself what you need to have? You cannot live on borrowed light. And so it is a magnificent heritage, but you can't live off of that. What are you doing? And are you pressing forward so that your testimony is deepening into conversion unto the Lord Jesus Christ. There are some people you will teach who will be converted to you, not to the church. As charming as you are, that's not a good thing. Their affection for you will never be enough when adversity and difficulty and challenge comes. They have to be converted, not just have testimonies. There are people who are converted to the programs of the church, And if a program in the church to which they are converted changes, then they all get upset and uptight. And no, no, the church isn't true anymore. Yeah, it is. You're not true to the church. Big difference. It's not only about having testimony. It is about testimony that leads to deepening conversion. Turn with me to Alma, chapter 23 in the Book of Mormon. Chapter 23, I'm going to begin reading in verse 5. And thousands were brought to the knowledge of the Lord. Let me stop for a second. Let me suggest to you that that phrase, knowledge of the Lord, is synonymous with testimony. And thousands were brought to obtain a testimony of the Lord. Yea, thousands were brought to believe in the traditions of the Nephites, and they were taught the records and prophecies which were handed down even to the present time. Now please notice in verse 6, And as sure as the Lord liveth, so sure as many as believed, or as many as were brought to the knowledge of the truth, through the preaching of Ammon and his brethren, according to the spirit of revelation and of prophecy, and the power of God working miracles in them. Yea, I say unto you, as the Lord liveth, as many of the Lamanites, as believed in their preaching. Let me suggest to you once again that that phrase, as believed in the preaching of Ammon and came to a knowledge of the Lord, what that means is, as many as obtained testimonies and, not or, and, were converted unto the Lord, never did fall away. The two key elements are knowledge of the Lord, converted unto the Lord, testimony, deepening conversion to him, knowing he is the Son of God and consistently living in such a way that the Son of God is reflected in who we are and what we do. Testimony is what we know to be true by the witness of the Spirit. Conversion is consistently being true to what we know. And it takes both. So the missionaries five or six years from now, if all you've got is a testimony, you may be in jeopardy. 
But if you are on the pathway of continuing conversion unto Christ, then the sure promise is you will never fall away. It starts first and foremost with me and with you. The greatest convert on your mission ought to be you. But you won't have that outcome if that's what you're trying to do. What is conversion? Now, please listen. Conversion is a turning away from the natural man. It's getting rid of the cookie monster. And you'll begin to notice that in your own service if you get over yourself, get out of the way, and quit worrying about everything's happening the way you want it. To the degree that you're constantly whining or murmuring or complaining about, I'm not getting this, Guess where you are? You're kind of stuck with a cookie monster mode. To the degree that you are turning outward, that becomes one of the indicators of conversion unto Christ because what is his character? To consistently turn out. We're taught by Paul that we are to have in us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. To the degree that through his grace, his power, his atonement, we increasingly obtain the mind and the character of Christ. Then we are turning away from the natural man, putting off the natural man, and increasingly becoming a saint more fully converted unto the Lord through his atonement. What is it that you will help your investigators to do? In every instance, you're helping them to turn. To turn from a focus on self to a focus reaching outward and upward. That is putting off the natural man. That is deepening conversion unto the Lord. The word repent, anytime you find the word repent in the scriptures, you can substitute the word turn. When a person commits a sin, you turn away from God. And where are you looking primarily? Self. Whenever you repent, you are returning, turning back to God. So what you're doing is declaring repentance. What is it you are proclaiming? Turn to God. Quit worshiping the self. Turn to God. And there are ordinances, there are covenants, there are principles, and there are doctrines that can help you make that turn. And that turn away from self and to God is the only and the ultimate source of lasting joy and happiness. The greatest thing about the missionary program of the church for you as an individual is that for you young people, you young men at age 19, 20, 21, that is the epitome of the natural man in the lives of most young people. They couldn't possibly be more self-centered. And what are you doing? You're in the MTC on Christmas getting no presents. It's not about you. You're here preparing to go and serve other people. If you have eyes to see and ears to hear every single thing that you will teach, is intended to facilitate one simple thing. Putting off the natural man, turning away from self, becoming a saint, reaching out in love and service and compassion to others through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Now, I want to share briefly an experience I had when I was serving as a stake president. As you listen to this, you can think the character of Christ being so concerned about others when you're in the middle of your own trouble and adversity. I just don't think I can do that. That capacity is not reserved for people who are 95 years old. That can happen in the life of any member of this church because it is accomplished not through our willpower, not through our goal setting and personal determination. It is accomplished through the atonement of Christ. And it happens to very ordinary garden variety members of this church who are pressing forward, building upon testimony and becoming more fully converted unto the Lord Jesus Christ. 
A number of years ago, before the advent of cell phones, I was in the shower early, early one morning. Sister Bednar came and said, there's an emergency phone call. Now, because this is before the days of cell phones, I had to hurry, jump out of the shower, put on a robe, go take the phone call. It was from a sister in our stake. She said, President, there has been a terrible accident. And there are three young women, teenagers, who were involved in this accident. At this point, we know that one of them is dead. The other two are seriously injured. And I need your help. I said, please tell me what I can do. They're being transported to the medical center in the city where you live. This sister lived many miles away. She said, we need you to go and identify these girls and then provide whatever other assistance is necessary. I said, I'll be glad to do that. While I was talking to her, I clearly was trying to zero in on her comments and what she was telling me. And as I did that, I began to recognize that she was also talking to somebody else. She had two telephones. She had two handsets, one in each hand with a telephone to each ear. And what I began to hear and understand is that she was talking to a nurse, a Latter-day Saint woman, a nurse, who was assisting in the treatment of these girls, getting them ready for transport to the hospital. Are you with me so far? So I'm hearing what she's saying to me, and I'm hearing some of what's being said through the phone that's coming to her from the nurse. This lady's daughter was one of the three girls, and she doesn't know if she's alive or is the one girl who has been pronounced dead. While I am talking to her, I hear the nurse say, we have positively identified one of the girls. The one who has passed away is your daughter. Now, elders and sisters, in the very instant that this woman learns of the death of her daughter, she says to me, President Bednar, we need to now quickly communicate with the other two mothers and make sure that they are aware of what's happening and that their daughters are being transported to the medical center. I could not believe what I was hearing. Now, what would most of us do? Oh, my gosh, we'd be terribly upset. Well, of course, she was heartbroken. But that was not her first concern. Her very first concern, instinctively, was for the welfare of the other two mothers. That is the character of Christ. Not in the New Testament. Not in the Book of Mormon. In the life of a really very ordinary Latter-day Saint like you or like me. And that is what she had been becoming through the atonement of Christ, turning her testimony, deepening to conversion, a turning away from self, turning outward, emulating Christ. Have you received his image in your countenance? Is Christ in you? Well, one of the ways to get a sense of that is to the degree we're increasingly turning out instead of turning in. Another one of these young women who was involved in this accident was the daughter of a Ward Relief Society president. This Ward Relief Society president had only one child, this daughter, and she was a single mom. So her only child had just died in this accident. I mentioned that I had gone to the hospital. I had to identify these girls and they had been badly disfigured and injured in the accident. Several days later, as I was working with this sister in making arrangements for the funeral of her only daughter, she said to me, President, I've been thinking. 
it must have been very difficult for you to see my daughter at the hospital the other day. Now, as you know that for the funeral, we're going to have a closed casket ceremony and funeral. But the people at the, at the funeral home have done a, a magnificent job of preparing my daughter for burial. Why don't you and Sister Bednar come to the funeral home with me so that you can see her before they close the casket? And then your final memory of my daughter will not be what you saw in the hospital. It will be what you see in the casket. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. This woman has lost her only child, and she is worried about me having seen her daughter so terribly disfigured in the hospital. And she did not want that to be the lasting image or memory that I would have of her daughter. That is the character of Christ. In the midst of her greatest personal anguish, she turns out when the natural man or the natural woman in you and me would turn inward. Now, I think this third one is perhaps the most striking. Do you remember that character is moral qualities, strongly developed, strikingly displayed, and consistently lived? Remember I said she's a Ward Relief Society president? On the morning of her daughter's funeral, a sister in the ward who did not know about her daughter's death called her out, chewed, called her up, chewed her out, blasted her because this self-entitled feeling member of the ward had a cold and nobody from the Relief Society had been there yet to deliver food. And do you know what that Relief Society president did? On her way to the funeral for her daughter, she delivered a meal to that whining, complaining sister that she had prepared. That is the character of Christ. That takes a whole lot more than knowing the gospel is true. That takes knowing it's true and then consistently being true to what we know, not in our own strength, but in the strength of the Lord. That's the turn from self to other. That is moving from testimony to conversion. That is putting off the natural man and becoming a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. None of that is possible without the character of Christ. Three things are necessary to exercise faith in God unto life and salvation. Accepting the idea that God exists. A correct understanding of his character, attributes, and perfections. And number three, an actual knowledge that the course that we are pursuing in our own life is in accordance with God's mind and will. Only as we meet those three requirements can we be blessed with the spiritual gift of faith unto life and salvation. Now, elders and sisters, that's just enough to get you started about the character of Christ. You should begin a lifelong pursuit of learning of him, not just about him, learning of him. As you do that, you'll be blessed in magnificent ways, primarily in being a more effective tool in the hands of the Lord to bless and serve other people. Your family, during your service as a missionary, the people that you'll teach, those whom you'll ser serve throughout your whole life. And as you turn outward, then you'll be blessed. But that's not the primary reason you turn outward. That's, the, that's what happens. That's the blessing. But if you seek for that, if you focus on that, that won't be the blessing that you receive. Turn with me to Ether.
chapter 3. In chapter 3, we find the brother of Jared. He's building barges. He's concerned that there's no light in the barges. He prays to find out what do we do to get light. And in essence, God says to him, well, what do you propose? That's a very instructive episode. If you just pray and ask and sit and wait, you may be waiting a long time before you get an answer. In most instances, you have to go with a proposal and seek confirmation of the proposal, not just sit and wait for heaven to tell you what to do. So the brother of Jared basically says, well, I could fashion these stones, and if you'd touch them, then they'd be illuminated, and we could use those and put them in the barges and we'd have light. God says, good plan, we'll do that. Beginning in verse 4. And I know, O Lord, that thou hast all power... And can do whatsoever thou wilt for the benefit of man. Therefore, touch these stones, O Lord, with thy finger. And prepare them that they may shine forth in darkness. And they shall shine forth unto us in the vessels which we have prepared. That we may have light while we shall cross the sea. Behold, O Lord, thou canst do this. We know that thou art able to show forth great power. Which looks small unto the understanding of men. And it came to pass that when the brother of Jared had said these words, behold, the Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stones one by one with his finger. Question, why touch the 16 stones one by one? Why not just go and all 16 illuminate at once? I shouldn't, I should just leave you with that question and let you figure it out. But consider Notice that at the end of that sentence, there's a period, right? The Lord stretched forth his hand and touched the stones one by one with his finger, period. And the veil was taken from off the eyes of the brother of Jared, and he saw the finger of the Lord. Have you ever seen the pictures where it shows the finger of the Lord touching the stones? Now, this is just a Dave Bednar opinion. That can't be right. It's a nice painting, but doctrinally, I don't think it can be right. The brother of Jared prays, 16 stones. They're illuminated one by one. Does he see the finger of the Lord touch the first one? No, period, end of the sentence. The Lord stretched forth his hand, touched the stones one by one with his finger. Boom. Then the next sentence says, and the veil was taken. I want you to imagine the 16 stones. Brother of Jared's, mustering all the faith that he's got, pleading with all of his heart. Finger of the Lord touches the stone, but he can't see it yet. You receive no witness until after the trial of your faith. If you saw the finger on the first stone, no trial of your faith. So it would contradict correct principles. Finger of the Lord touches the stone, it's illuminated. What would you do if you were the brother of Jared? Now, again, I'm not trying to be like, I go, whoa. Wouldn't you? When you saw that illuminate, you go, wow. What does that do to your faith? It's not a sign. You don't get faith through signs. It would be evidence of things not seen. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You didn't see the finger, but now you're getting the evidence. That's an entire cycle that's described in Alma 32. Simply have a desire to believe. Experiment upon the word. Exercise your faith. And when you begin to feel the swelling motions, you'll say within yourself, yeah, this is a good seed. Wow, this is working. So you go through another episode, another Alma 32. Second stone is illuminated. Your wow is not quite as surprising now. It wasn't a lack of faith. You're just going, yeah, this is great. Third one, fourth one. I don't know at what point, but at some point along the way, Hasn't your faith been confirmed by evidence and now your evidence produces pure knowledge? And as that is increasing, the Lord can no longer withhold himself and at some point along the way, you see the finger of the Lord. Now, what is it that produces that? 
focusing on others. The stones are a representation of people that we serve. As a bishop, as a stake president, as a home teacher, I have seen sin-sick souls where the light of the gospel is no longer with them. And the touch of the master's hand, the Savior touches them. And through repentance, turning away from self-centered sin, turning back to God, doing the things that are necessary to be made clean, the light returns who is blessed in that service? Certainly the individual, but so are you. Because you see the effects of the atonement in the life of that individual. And as you do that, consistently, steadily focusing on serving and blessing others, what you learn of Christ as a great blessing in your own life, just as it was a great blessing in the life of the brother of Jared. But you don't get that because you want it. You get that because you are losing yourself in the service of others, which is the character of Christ. I hope some of this made sense. It's about a turn, putting off the natural man and becoming a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. Now, what I have just described, if you are sitting here as a 19-year-old young man, a 21-year-old young woman, you could look forward in your life and say, there's no way I'm ever going to get there. You do this line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. It doesn't happen all at once. It comes a little bit every day. And I want to bear solemn, sure witness of the reality of the grace that enables you and me to do this. The grace of Christ is his enabling and strengthening power. The atonement of Christ cleanses us from sin, but it also provides increased capacity to do good and become better. You and I as a natural man or a natural woman, could never do what I've described today. But in the strength of the Lord and through his grace, we can. Listen one more time to Mosiah 319 while I emphasize what is the most important element of that verse. Putteth off the natural man and becometh a saint through the atonement of Christ the Lord. How do we put off the natural man? Through the atonement, through the saving ordinances of baptism by immersion for the remission of sins, the laying on of hands for the gift of the Holy Ghost, pressing forward with a steadfastness and in obedience to our covenants and becometh a saint. Well, that's not only just not doing bad stuff, that's doing better good stuff. Well, how do you develop the ability to do better good stuff? Well, I've got to work harder. There are members of the church who drive themselves crazy doing silly work, thinking if I'm working harder in busyness, it's going to make me a saint. No, it's not. It's going to make you crazy. <laughs> saint means you become more like the Savior we obtain more of the character of Christ, not because we're just working hard, which you have to do, but that's not enough. It's a spiritual gift. It's a blessing that possesses us as we are steadfastly honoring our covenants, consistently living what we know to be true and deepening our conversion, not to the church, not to the people, not to the programs, converted unto the Lord. Why convert it unto the Lord? Because we are to have in us the same mind that was in Christ Jesus. We are to obtain the character of Christ. His atonement blesses us with strength beyond our own. 
strength beyond our own. When you don't think you can do this, you're right. But in the strength of the Lord, you can. When Paul says, when I am weak, then I am strong, you read that and you go, what does that mean? It means that when he recognizes his natural fallen state, when he recognizes that he's a natural man, he's weak, and he acknowledges his total dependence upon the Savior and his atonement and the strengthening power that comes from that atonement. When I am weak, then I am strong. Recall Ammon. I will not boast of my own strength, but I will boast of my God, for in his strength I can do all things. I would be the first one on the planet to tell you I don't have any of what it takes to be a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Can't possibly do it. But in his strength, I can be blessed with capacity way beyond my own, and so can you. It's not a blessing reserved for a highly visible position in the church. That is a sure promise and blessing for every member of this church, regardless of age, regardless of experience, regardless of background, who is pressing forward along the straight and narrow path from testimony to conversion and ongoing, deepening, continuing conversion unto the Lord. It begins with you. You all have testimonies. Some of you really need to work on becoming converted. Start now. But it's not about you. That's your preparation to help other people make the turn away from self and to God through the saving ordinances and principles of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And as you lose yourself in that service to others, ultimately you will find yourself because you're not looking. If you go looking for yourself, you'll never find it. If you lose yourself in others and you obtain the character of Christ, you'll find yourself, but you won't be looking for it. It's the only way it ever comes. Now, you should have some things to do. If you've been listening, if the Holy Ghost has been helping you prepare some small plates, you have some homework. And it'll be different for perhaps almost all of you. But you have some things to go and do. I'll give you just one simple, practical suggestion. Get a brand new copy of the Book of Mormon. Paperback, inexpensive, the kind that missionaries use. Think you might be able to find one of those? And if you have a question or you have something that you're trying to learn about, read the Book of Mormon. Don't do computer keyword searches. Just read it from the first page to the last page. And mark it up in relation to the question that you're trying to answer or the thing that you're trying to learn. So I had an inexpensive paperback copy trying to learn about the character of Christ. Book of Mormon, New Testament, it's all marked up. And when you get all done reading, studying, marking, getting that stuff, then pull it out, think about it, ponder it, pray about it, and just prepare a simple summary, half page, using a pencil, of what you learned about that particular question or the particular topic. By the time you're my age, you ought to have four or five hundred copies of the Book of Mormon in a bookshelf someplace that would chronicle your learning about important questions in your life and things that you were trying to understand better about the gospel. If you'll be that diligent in feasting upon the word, it helps you become converted unto the Lord and you will never fall away. So please do the homework that the Holy Ghost is assigning you during the course of our Christmas morning together. Now, I conclude with what matters most. First, before I declare my witness, let me tell you that I love you. I love you and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here with you on Christmas, on the Sabbath. 
and to declare my witness of him. I witness that God, the eternal Father, is the Father of our spirits. I know, I testify, and I witness that Jesus the Christ is the only begotten Son of the eternal Father. I know that he lives. I know he speaks. I know this is his church, and I witness that he stands at the head and directs its affairs. He is resurrected. The tomb is empty. This is the living church of Jesus Christ because the living Savior stands at its head. The Father and the Son appeared to Joseph Smith. I witness that is true. Other heavenly messengers have been to the earth in this dispensation to restore priesthood authority and priesthood keys. I witness those keys are real. They are in the earth. They bind on earth and in heaven. They loose on earth and in heaven. I witness that President Thomas S. Monson is the senior apostle who both holds and is authorized to exercise all of those priesthood keys. I witness that the Book of Mormon is the Word of God and that you will draw closer to the Savior by reading, studying, and abiding by its teachings than by any other book. I declare and I witness that you have been called of God by prophecy to serve as full-time missionaries. I participate in the process whereby you are assigned. Only apostles do that. You are not in some stack of paper randomly assigned to some mission. Each one of you was individually considered one by one by a man you sustain as a prophet, seer, and revelator, even one of the twelve apostles. Nothing affirms my faith about the reality of revelation more than when I have the opportunity to assign missionaries. I witness the Lord knows you by name. Now, I declare that all of these things are true. And as we conclude, I invoke upon you a really very simple blessing, but one that will change your life forever. I invoke the blessing that according to both your desire and your diligence, you will increase in your understanding of the true character of Christ. And that attendant to that understanding, 